Amen. What a blessing. I love that song. I really do. Well, I want to invite you to turn back in your Bibles once again to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. And I I had made a comment that next week I was going to be preaching on why I'm not a Calvinist. But uh, because of the fact that I'm not going to finish the message uh, today that I started last week, uh, we'll have to we'll have to postpone that. But I uh, I will give you something next week uh, to think about concerning why I'm not a Calvinist. Just one thing, and then we'll we'll get more into that hopefully uh, the the following week after. But uh, I want to. I want to reassure you that that this that this chapter that we're in is is so I mean it is so rich, it, it, it is uh, I mean it is just beyond our our comprehension to be able to understand everything that is in here, but the assurance that this 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 one chapter gives us uh, concerning our salvation is just. I mean, it, it, it's beyond uh, the understanding of how someone could ever read what is there and, and have any doubt in their mind that salvation isn't eternal, that salvation can, can be lost. I mean, I, I, they're, they're, I, I do not understand someone that, that can experience the things that are in chapter number 8 and walk away from it and say, I don't know if I'm saved or not. I mean, I've done all that needs to be done, but I just don't know. That is a sad, sad life to lead. For someone to, to want to be saved, do all that needs to be saved, and still walk away thinking, I don't know if I really am saved. There are people that do that. They might be somebody here that struggles with their salvation. But the, the, the good thing is, in the Word of God, God placed the areas of assurance. And we have been looking in chapter number 8, and it is compact, full of assurance. The very first, cha- the very first verse tells us, There is therefore no condemnation to them are in Christ, Christ, Christ Jesus. There's none. It didn't say they, were, they might be some. You know what I like about Christianity above all other religions? Is it has, it has hope. It has hope. Had a Muslim come into our church, uh, it's been probably four months ago, on a Wednesday night. He called me before he came. He said, I want to, I want to talk with you after service. I said, okay, that'd be great. So he came and we went back to the, the, the little library that we have, and, and he sat down, and we, we got to talking about what salvation was, what it meant to be saved. And he said, one thing I like about what Christianity says more than, any, than what the, the, the uh, Muslims uh, believe is that there's hope. He said, as a Muslim, I can lead my life as strict as I want to lead it and, and be as, as strict in being a Muslim as I can ever be, and I can still get to God. And he can say, you're not coming in. Can I tell you this right here? That the Bible tells us that, that once we're children of God, God himself will never reject us. Never. That is such an assurance. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Boy, that's tremendous. And then we, we saw that, that, that in our lives, that as we're living our lives, there seem to be things that, that are just going wrong, that are bad. That are, I mean, you just don't know why they're happening. You, you can't understand it. You, you just, it just boggles your mind. How can I love God? I want to serve God. And my life is just all upside down and problems everywhere. And he said that he's working all things for our good eternally. That all things that happen to us in this world are working for our eternal good. So it's easy for us to be able to, even in that, what we're suffering through, to be able to say, Lord, I glorify you in it. 
because we know that it's working for his glory and our good. And that's in chapter number 8. And then last week, we, lo- we started looking at what can make us lose our salvation. If God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, just think about just that one concept. If God is on my side, what am I worried about? See, that's what David had in his mind when he went down to fight Goliath. He said, I'm, I'm coming to you in the, in, in the name of the Most High God. He didn't say, I'm coming to you because I got a sling, and that boy, I would slain a, a bear, and I slain a, a, a lion. I, no, he's coming to him because he knew God was on his side. You know, if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, I tell you what. Then we talked about if we could lose our salvation, the very first person that would be able to do that would be God Himself. And we talked, we we looked at that He gave that which was most precious to Him. I mean, He gave He gave the most. I mean, he didn't just give, he didn't, he didn't give a portion of goodness. And he didn't give a portion of his best. He gave all of his best. His own son. If he, w- if he would not withhold that which was the best that he had for, from redeeming us, how much more to keep us? I mean, we, I mean, we talked about the, the, in, the, in the Jewish custom, the, the, the argument was always from the greatest to the least. That he gave the greatest to buy us, the least to keep us. But the price that it cost was to, to obtain us, then don't you think that he wouldn't mind spending that little bit more to keep us. Oh, I'm so grateful for that. I want to re- focus your attention to the scriptures in verse number 30, and we're going to read down once again, and then we'll get into the message after I pray. It says in verse number 30, it says, Moreover, whom he predestined, them, also, them he also called, and to whom he called, them he also justified. And to them that he justified, them he glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you so much for your good grace and mercy. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us today. 
Lord, that you would help us to be able to see in thy word the assurance that you've given to us. Lord, I love you and thank you for all you do. Bless our prayers. We continue to endeavor to look into your word and to abound, uh, uh, to, to, to experience and to bring those truths to life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What can make us lose our salvation? Well, we looked at can people. In the very first, in verse number 30, it says, What shall we say then if God be for us? Who can be against us? And we looked at it. There, there's no that are greater than God. Nobody. There's no person that's going to be able to stand it that can withstand God. And then we already talked about it, but we looked at God himself. And he said he spared not his only son. Verse number 32, it said, He that spared not his only son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I like what Isaiah 53, verse number 10 says. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put Jesus to the greatest grief that there ever was. He spared not his own son. In that verse that we, that, that we read, uh, his own, it, it, is, it gives the ideal in the Greek that it, it was that which was privately possessed by God. That which was his private possession. I don't know about you, but there's things in my house I don't let nobody else touch. They're mine. Nobody, nobody gets to hold it. I mean, the, the grandkids, as sweet as they are, they come over, they don't get to touch it. They're up on the top shelf somewhere where nobody can get their fingers on it, amen? My wife don't, don't, don't pull it down and fill through it. No, this is, this is, this is mine, and it's something that's only for me. That is the idea that Christ was to God. That, that he was his and nobody else's. That's the idea when he gives that phrase, his own son. It belonged to him. His son was his own love. God was willing to do all that for us. To give his best, the greatest gift for us to be saved. That's how much God loved us. If he's willing to do that, don't you think that he's willing to do the lesser to keep us? To do the lesser to keep us. Look what it says in that very same verse. It says in the, in the latter part of it, it says, But delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Since he has delivered him over, that means to, in, in, in a very graphical term, that, is, that means to hand him over to the persecutor. Since the father delivered the son to the destruction, to damnation, or the punishment of, of sin, won't he freely give us all that would flow out of that? All that would be necessary that we have a surety of our salvation. He who delivered Jesus to death, well, it wasn't Judas, even though he got paid for it. It wasn't Pilate, and even though he feared the people. It wasn't the Jews, even though they envied who he was and, and was so jealous of, of all that he could do. But it was the Father who did it all for us. For us all. The for us all, are, in verse number 32, is the same us that is in verse number 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? People may read this and say, okay, I understand that nobody can take, I mean, there's not a person out there that can take 
my salvation. I, I can see that God is not willing, or, or because of what he's did, he's, he's, he's not willing to take our salvation from us. And he's committed himself to us, has given us the greatest gift. But what about Satan? What about Satan? Satan? Satan desires to do that. Satan, I mean, that is his job. That is what he's working towards. That is his ultimate goal. The destruction of, of the believer and, and mankind in itself. He wants to destroy. He wants to, he wants to, he wants to make people doubt. Isn't that what he would desire to do with Job? He desired to destroy his faith. He wanted to destroy the faith of Peter also. Jesus told Peter that Satan desired to sift him. And Satan went before God in the book of Job. He said to him, he said, he said, Job was only serving you because you blessed him. He's only faithful to you because you're blessing him. If you take away his blessing, he'll curse you to your face. God turned Satan loose. And Satan went. And one day, Satan removed all the animals. He killed all of them. All his livestock. All his children. And Job still served God. Satan went back to God and said, if you take his health, he'll, he'll surely curse you if you take his health. And God said, okay, but you can't take his life. And sure enough, Satan took his health. His friends came and told him just how pitiful he was and how, how bad off he was and how he sinned against God and how he must, he just he must have done something wicked. And Job lied there isolated and in agony. He had no idea what was going on, what was the cause of it, why it was happening to him. He did not even, he never knew the the conversation that took place in heaven between God and Satan. He did not know the reason behind what was going on in his life. But in the midst of all that, Satan could not take the faith of Job away. He could not take it away. He left him sick without anything to the place where he would take broken pottery and scrape his sores. But yet, Job never lost what he had in God. Satan always desires to torment. He always desires to to, to destroy. But in the middle of it all, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. What faith. What faith he had in God. You can't kill the faith because God sustains all in the midst of all trouble. Faith is that that overcomes. Satan in the book of Revelation is called the, the accuser. In the book of Revelation chapter number 12, he is, stands before the throne day and night accusing the brethren. He is the accuser that stands there. He did it with Job. He also did it in... in uh, Zechariah chapter number 3 with the high priest. He did it with, with Peter uh, when he denied Christ. He sifted him. And then Paul in 
2 Corinthians chapter number 12. He was, it was the messenger of Satan, the thorn in the flesh that he had. That God said, my grace is sufficient. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He is, he is that tormentor. And with all that in background, we come to verse number 33. It says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who can lay anything to the charge of those that are elected of God? It is the exact same question that is asked in verse number 34. Who is he that condemneth? Who's going to be able to stand before God and, 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 and lay any charge to the children of God or, or condemn any of the children of God? That is the question. Because both these questions are exactly the same. One brings a charge and the other is the result of that charge. Condemnation. This is what Satan desires. This is what he does before the throne of God day and night. He, he accuses the brethren before him. The question is, can he succeed? Is he able to be able to make a difference when he does this? Well, the answer is in verse number 33. At the very last part, it says, it is God that justifies. It is God that justifies. God is the one that justifies. And literally, what it, in the Greek, what it says is God, God is the one justifying. A continual justification on our part. God only condemns. And God only declares righteous. There's none other. If God declares us righteous in Christ, he can't with the same degree, at the same time, declare us guilty in need of judgment. You know what the great thing is about this? There is no other court of repeal. There is no other higher court to go to. Satan always tries to bring a case against God's salvation, God's elect, God's love, God's declaration, God's righteousness, and God's judgment. But God has already determined his final verdict. And his final verdict is, is based upon his own sovereign purpose. The regeneration of the work of the Holy Spirit by which we have the life that lives inside of us. The provision of Christ's death and resurrection on our behalf and the active function of faith on our part that brings us to salvation. That is the point that's given. There's no higher court than God. There's nobody that's going to, that they're going to appeal to. He is the ultimate. Because God has said it. It is final. The verdict has been made. It is God that justifieth his people. And no accusation from Satan can stand against them. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that the Bible tells us there's nothing on earth that can stand against us? The reason being is because of the fact that the verdict has already been made. God has already declared those that are in Christ Jesus that they're justified. Justified. This ought to be this right here ought to be total assurance for the believer. This ought to be something that the believer can take a hold of and say, you know what? It does not matter what I think in my mind. It doesn't even matter what I feel in my body. God said it is so. Can I tell you you don't have to agree with God for it to be so? You don't. God saying it so means it's true. Sad thing, I know that in, that in the world that we live in today, we've heard the prosperity preachers say that Jesus wants you to be happy. 
I want you to be healthy. I want you to be whole and, prosper, and, and prosperous in every sense of the word. Funny to me that it, that wasn't so in Job's case. It wasn't even so in Peter's case. And it wasn't so in Paul's case that he, that he suffered with that thorn in the flesh all the days of his life and under bountiful suffering. Satan, with all that he can bring upon those that, that lived in these men and in those that live today as believers, all that it is can't withstand that which God has already said. God has redeemed us. And he has justified us. All that are believers. Listen, that's why Charles Wesley said this. Bold shall I stand in that great day. For who ought to my charge shall lay. Fully through, thoroughly, uh, fully through thee. Absolute sovereign I am from sin, fear, from guilt and shame. And that is, should be the way that we believe. Who shall lay any charge or anything to God's elect? It is God that justifies. It is because we are God's elect who he has changed. God has predestined us, foreknown us, and determined us to be justified. So when Satan tries to bring us before the throne of, of God as, as that to be judged, when we come, we do not come as outlaws. We do not come as criminals. But we come as the elect of God, declared righteous before him. Declared righteous. We therefore only uh, have one other person that's left for us to be able to look at. Actually two, but I'm, 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 I'm going to just do one of them because of the time. For us to look at, and that is Christ. What about Christ? Could, could he give us up? Would he turn us over? Would he say, well, you know, I, I, I don't desire to be your savior anymore. Listen to what it says in verse number 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also maketh intercession for us. Christ Jesus. Is he going to condemn us? Listen to what he said. He died. He was risen. He's at the right hand of God. And not only that, he's making an intercession for us. So Christ that died for us, is he the one that could separate us? The obvious point is no. If he died for us, why would he turn around and separate us from God? When he died to receive us and, pay, and made the full payment of sin on our behalf. Took away all of our guilt. Placed it upon himself. He died in our place. He bore our punishment. He's not going to condemn us. Because he's already paid for us. Not only did he die for us, but he was, he was risen for us. His atonement satisfied God. And listen, I want you to see this. And the validation of his work on the cross was the resurrection from the dead. That was God 
putting his stamp of approval on it, saying, I approve. I know all y'all been watching those TV shows that I approve this message. God said when he saw Christ on the cross of Calvary, he said, I approve this message. He raised him from the dead. The resurrection affirmed the accomplishment of atonement of the work of the cross on our behalf. Christ died, paid in full the penalty of all the sins of all people who would ever believe through humanity's history to declare that God had raised him from the dead There's even another element that, that is here for us to be able to grasp onto. Not only did he die, not only did he rose again, but he is seated at the right hand of God. Can I tell you, he's in a, he's in a seat of, of, of authority there, the right hand. He paid for our sin. God validated our, the payment. And now he sits at the place of authority. Psalms 110 in verse 1, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord. And listen, I want I to I tell you something. I believe that Jesus is God. But I believe also there's a God the Father. And I believe there's a God the Holy Spirit. There's a sect out there that believes that there's only Jesus. And they call Jesus only. And they cannot answer the question, who the Lord is, it said to the Lord. So if they ever ask you about it, point them to this verse. But Jesus is the Lord. And God is the Lord. That says here, Set thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He's been exalted. God has highly exalted him for the work that he did on the cross of Calvary. He gave him a name that's above all names. And he set him at his own right hand. And every knee shall bow before him. He's ascended up into heaven. And there, he not only is died, was resurrected and exalted, but listen to this, he is making intercession for us. Every time that Satan comes forward, he, 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 he makes an accusation. Listen to what it says in verse number 34, the very last phrase. It says, who also makes intercession for us. He is standing there before the throne, and every time the accusation comes forth, Jesus said, I'll answer that question. I paid it in full. I paid it in full. There's no one that can take away what God has given. Our salvation is sure. Christ proved it by dying and raising and now sits and pleads our case on a continual basis. We're secure. Salvation is forever. Let no one come to you and, and deceive you and rob you of the joy of knowing that, of, of living that in your life. Because he gives us, in this chapter, the ministry of the blessedness of a surety that is given by the Holy Spirit of God that lies with inside of us. Oh, I wish I could. Continue to finish this little portion out. But there's one other person that, that stands there that. I'm not going to cover, but I want to give it to you anyway. And that's us. Ourselves. Can we ourselves take away our own salvation that we 
receive? We can. Those who are truly believed of God, they have the Holy Spirit of God that lies inside of them. That bears witness with them that they are children of God. He said, he never leave you nor forsake you. You know what that really means? That really means that <laughs> you can't get rid of him. I mean, in Corinthians, Paul went as far as to say, don't you know that it's your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have in you, which you are of God, and you're not your own? I mean, he declared that what you have, <laughs> you're never going to get rid of. And they were carnal Christians. I mean, they were pitiful. If you don't believe it, read, read 1 Corinthians. It's, I mean, they're just, they're, you, you would think, well, God, God surely killed them. He did some of them. But God has made that which he provided for us, that when we receive it, we become a part of him to the place that we're inseparable. How tremendous that is. There's nobody that can ever take away our salvation. I like what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah 31. said, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Oh, how he's loved us. He didn't just say he loved us, he proved. He loved us. And then he didn't just prove he loved us by dying for us and being risen again. He gave us an earnest of that love. The Holy Spirit of God. Oh, what assurance. What assurance. Let's stand together. Father, I thank you so much for your great love and your goodness and your grace and your mercy. And Lord, I thank you so much for what it's been pinned down here in chapter number 8 to reveal the assurance of that in the life of a believer. Lord, I pray that you would have your will in our lives. And Lord, if there's one here that it doesn't know you as Savior or one that hears this and doesn't know you as Savior, I pray, Lord, that you would help them, Lord, to, 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 to see your, your goodness, your kindness, your, your mercy. in the Word of God to receive you as that one that will never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, I pray you'd have your blessed will in our lives. We love you and thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Jeff, what we're going to say.